Mr. Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, Carleton graduates. It is a great privilege to introduce the poet, novelist, playwright, Anne Michaels. Few authors have enjoyed such high praise from their fellow writers, both here in Canada and around the world. Anne Michaels' first book, a volume of poetry entitled The Weight of Oranges, won the Commonwealth Prize in 1986. Her second collection, Miner's Pond, won the National Magazine Award, the Canadian Authors Association Award for Poetry, and a nomination for the Governor General's Award. She has collaborated on a theater project entitled Vanishing Points, but she's perhaps best known for her novels, the first of which, Fugitive Pieces, was awarded the Books in Canada First Novel Award, the Trillium Book Award, the Orange Prize for Fiction, and the Guardian Fiction Prize. Very few writers dare to conjure up such expansive, imaginative landscapes, from meditations on the haunting beauty of music and the contingencies of weather, to lyrical evocations of the deep time of geological change. Her writing insists on the connections between major historical events, the Holocaust, the moving of an Egyptian temple threatened by floodwaters from a new dam, the construction of the St. Lawrence Seaway, and the intensely private world of individuals who struggle to make sense of their lives in the face of these larger pressures. Running through all of these is an unwavering sense of the fragility, but also the necessity of relationships, whether of love or friendship, work or family. At the core of all of these issues in Anne Michael's writing is the idea of the power of stories. The way that sharing stories keeps memories alive. And the way that stories can help us to cope with the burden of memories. Most of all, it is about the many different ways that we find to share these stories with one another. And the power of the stories we share to sustain communities across time. As we gather together this final time on the threshold of dispersing, moving beyond the close-knit bonds that you have created during your years here at Carleton, even as you begin to find ways to renew those friendships in the next stages of your lives, there can be few writers whose insights are more appropriate. Mr. Chancellor, in recognition of her outstanding contribution to the arts and Canadian culture, I request that you confer the degree of Doctor of Literature, Honoris Causa, upon Anne Michaels. By virtue of my authority, I confer upon you this degree of Doctor of Literature, Honoris Causa. Mr. Chancellor, Charles Chi, Mr. Tony Tattersfield of the Board of Governors, Madam President and Vice Chancellor, Dr. Runty, Professor Paul Keane, members of the faculty, graduates of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, families and friends of the graduates, welcome. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here today, celebrating your achievement and joining together to mark so many years of disciplined, creative effort. Congratulations to you all. I thank the university for this honor today. I'm deeply grateful. I write and I read in order to hold another human being close. As a writer, it is an absolute privilege, a privilege I have never taken for granted, to spend two or three or four hundred pages in the company of a reader, to hold close with the reader through perilous territory, 
for that is one aim I have always had, to travel in the company of a reader through territory that is philosophically, morally, emotionally perilous, never reducing the complexity of historical event and never publishing if I have not in some way been able to deliver the reader and myself to the other side. My work is concerned with history, with ways of thinking about history, that there is nothing a man will not do to another, nothing a man will not do for another. And what love makes us capable of and incapable of. This has always been the territory of my books. The deeper one's engagement with history, the deeper one's engagement with the future. Some years ago, I wrote a novel called Fugitive Pieces, and I'd like to talk a little about the process of writing that book, because it taught me a great deal as a writer and a human being. And I hope that some of what I've learned will also have some meaning for you. This novel took 10 years to write. It concerns the Second World War, and there was a massive amount of research in many areas, history, paleobotany, archaeology, geology. As much as humanly possible, I try to write undefended. By this I mean without the defense of assumptions, whether political, psychological, religious, philosophical. This is always a risk because I don't know where my search and research will abandon me, what unbearable conclusions may await me. Everyone here today will understand the process of in-depth research and understand that to collect facts is one thing and to discover the meaning of facts is quite another. And it is the meaning of the facts that takes so long Years of thinking about a single detail, perhaps for years staring at a single photograph to try and understand what it depicts and what comes before that split second of history and what comes after. I'm interested in the complicated relationship between huge historic event and intimate domestic event, in the relationship between personal grief and historical grief, how we remember privately and how we remember and memorialize publicly, collectively. Each community, each nation faces this question of public memory in its own way, according to its own needs. One famous example is Coventry in England. After the Second World War, they left the bombed ruins where they were and built a modern cathedral right next to the ruins. That was their way of commemoration. In Rotterdam, they cleared the ruins, erased them completely, then built a modern city in its place. In Warsaw, they made the heartbreaking decision to recreate, to make an exact replica of everything that had been destroyed. They replicated exactly every inch of the old town, every doorway and street lamp, every cornice, curb, and windowsill. They chose to make an exact copy that was their choice of public remembrance, an act of defiance and despair. Because of course, we can't bring back the past, we can't bring back the dead. I'm not interested in comparison, but in connection. During those 10 years of work, there were many months when I was absolutely silenced by the depth of horror I was trying to come to some, into some kind of relationship with. There were times when a single image, a single fact, was so inexpressibly painful to witness, and I very deliberately used that word, inexpressibly, that I simply stood up from my desk, left the room, closed the door, and did not write a word for months. This happened several times, and this never seemed inappropriate. It seemed the right and honest and morally imperative course of action. Some facts must be thought about for a long time before one can even begin to assume an understanding. The months away from the desk were painful. Who was I to speak? Who was I 
if I did not speak. I write because something is at stake. I write to learn to live better. I won't undertake a book unless the task feels, to me, necessary and, admittedly, somewhat impossible. And we must make the distinction between impossible and futile, for these things are entirely different. And although perhaps heretical to speak of at a convocation ceremony, forgive me, I want to speak up on behalf of failure. Failure always, always teaches us precisely what we need to know. It is an intimate knowledge, custom made, that cannot be gained by any other way. Failure is always forward motion. It is crammed with ideals. So the best thing to do with failure is to embrace it, befriend it. Mistakes are not separate from who we are and what we're meant to be. And those other names for failure, regret, shame, grief, these are not the end of the story. They are the middle of the story. Writers have a very particular relationship to failure, the innate failure of language to recreate experience. When one is writing about the horror of specific historical events, this is more than a question of style or technique. It is a moral question. How does one look closely at precisely the things from which we wish to turn away? One could write about the events of the war with brutal, ugly language. But to me, that's more of a lie, because it makes the assumption one is coming close to representing that horror. So in Fugitive Pieces, I chose a very different kind of language, a kind of language I hope would bring the reader and myself to the precise place just before one wants to turn away. I've been researching for some years when I found myself across the table from a friend who was reading book reviews in the newspaper. This man, very intelligent, very well read, gave a great groan and with real impatience complained, not another book about the Holocaust. He didn't know what I was working on, working on mutely for almost five years at that point. And for a moment, this statement plunged me into despair. His judgment truly had the power to depress me greatly, for he was a very astute reader. But very shortly after, I had a very different reaction. What book, I thought, could be written to reach that reader, precisely that reader, who feels there's nothing more to be said, whose heart and head is closed to that complexity? What would that book be? For years after I asked myself that question, what book could I attempt to write that would reach such a reader? His dismissal did not encourage me, not discourage me. It galvanized me. We have an instinctive belief in the power of violence. We don't need to be constantly reminded of that power. But that a single act of compassion, or simply the refusal to do harm, also has power, profound power. This is something we seem to need to be reminded of again and again. What am I trying to say here today? That the writing of this book taught me a kind of intellectual and emotional endurance and utter, utter humility in the face of fundamental questions and the experiences of others. It taught me that in a democratic society, we need the courage of our convictions every day, and that morality, compassionate action, is a muscle and needs to be exercised regularly. It taught me that sometimes our most morally significant actions are invisible, an inner steadfastness, that love is holding back as well as holding and that such convictions are like an underwater engine, the engine that we don't see, that moves the craft, that moves us forward. We are faced with many decisions in our lives, 
Often it will seem we must choose between A and B, but there is usually an invisible third choice. When faced with A or B, remember there is always C. Sometimes you have to invent that third choice, break the box to find it, but it is almost always there. You are at the most incredible brink, so much achieved and so much to come. What I've said today may seem utterly impractical, of no use, but I hope not. To continue to challenge yourself when yourself is the only measure, to live with as much integrity as you can, to insist on compassion. These are ideals, of course, but ideals must not be locked away as ornaments, the good china, they must be used. They may get banged about and broken, but that is what an ideal is for, for daily use and daily life. There are a few things I believe in absolutely, and only because I have tested those beliefs to their limit. It is only because I have tried so hard to prove them untrue that I can trust them, live by them, and offer them to a reader. One is the conviction that I try to hold on to every day, the line that Fugitive Pieces finally, finally arrives at. We must give what we most need. I wish you well, I wish you happiness. Congratulations to you all. <laughs>